Now, tonight I have a very powerful message. I'm telling you right now, folks, this is a powerful message. It's an important message. And I hope that you will really pay very careful attention to it and not be yakking and chatting amongst yourselves and, you know, some of those fun things we like to do. Because this message is very, very, very important to us, okay? So if you have your Bibles today, and you'd open them, please, to the book of Acts. The New Testament book of Acts, chapter 5. And as we did this morning, we're going to begin at verse 1, once again. And if we stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. This is the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Uh-oh. Scary, huh? Immediately, everybody knows what that's about. Acts chapter 5, beginning of verse 1 through verse 11. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And them that heard these things, and the young men, I'm sorry, and, and them that heard these, that's not it. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Would you bow your heads with me, Master? We love you tonight so much. We thank you, God, for this service. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you, God, for your power in our lives. God, as we're about to uh, deliver the message that you've laid upon my heart for this time, we just ask, God, that every heart would be prepared to receive what the Spirit would say unto the churches, Help us, God, to be ready. Help us, God, to be fertile ground that the planting of the word might bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. Oh, Master, speak to us this hour. Use your servant. Anoint us today from top to bottom, from head to toe. Let every word that's spoken be in divine order and according to your divine will. For we ask it today in none other than the wonderful, glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today. This is one of the most interesting stories because in the time of grace, in the dispensation of grace, that is in the New Testament era, this is probably one of the very few stories in New Testament scripture that illustrates God in a very stern kind of a light. He's not playing around. He's not playing any games. He, he doesn't like people who play with him either. And in this particular story, we know that the practice of the early church was that as people would come into the church, they were so excited to be saved and so excited to be part of the church of Jesus Christ that in the New Testament era, they were taking their property 
like their homes and their land and whatever they might have, and they were selling it, and they were bringing the proceeds immediately to the apostles and laying the proceeds at the apostles' feet so that the apostles could use that in doing the work of the ministry and in meeting the needs of all the believers in that area. Boy, wouldn't it be nice if people loved God so much that they were willing to say, well, I, I've got this piece of land over here, but I really don't need it. I was thinking of retiring on it one day, but I'm just going to go ahead and sell it and give the money to the church so that we can have us a place and we can do the work that God's called us to do. Wouldn't it be nice if there were some folks around that had those kind of resources and had that kind of attitude? But see, in the modern world, we don't have a whole lot of folks have that kind of attitude. But here... Ananias and Sapphira were, they were a couple who had chosen to participate in the practice that all the other believers were engaging in. They chose to at least appear as though they were engaging in the practice that all the rest of the believers did. A lot of people want to come to church, they don't really want to live like a Christian, they just want to try to look like they're doing everything a Christian does. They don't really want to pray. They just want to look like they pray. They don't really want to tithe. They want to look like they tithe. They don't really want to be faithful. They just want to look like they're faithful. You follow what I'm saying? And this is the dilemma because the reality is, and this is the title of my message today, the reality is today, children, we're either sold out or we're a holdout. And it's my desire today personally to be sold out and not a holdout. Amen. Amen. Sold out, not a holdout. Ananias and Sapphira came before Peter and they gave him a certain sum of money. And they told him that that amount of money is what they had sold their property for. And they were donating it to the work of God. But the reality is Peter was able to discern there was a lying spirit at work here. said, how hath Satan deceived you to lie to the Holy Ghost? How dare you lie to God? How dare you try to pull the wool over God's eyes and say one thing when you know good and well in your heart the situation is completely something different. First Ananias came and first he played the game and first he said yes. I sold it for a thousand when really he may have sold it for two thousand. He just wanted to keep some of the proceeds for himself. And as Peter explained to him, Ananias, it would have been fine if you had sold it and only given a thousand dollar offering or only given a portion of it as an offering. That would have been fine. But don't try to pretend like you're giving all of it when in reality you're only giving part. You're a holdout. A lot of people come to church today and they do the same exact thing. They'll talk the talk. They'll walk the walk as long as they're in the church house. And yet in reality, they're a holdout because there's parts of their lives and there's things that they're doing in private and when they're at home that do not agree with Christian conduct, that do not agree with the way that a believer ought to live. Come on now. Things that are inconsistent with the way a child of God ought to conduct themselves and they're holding out on God as though God somehow is suddenly blind and he doesn't see what's happening. And he doesn't know, what King, what we do in secret. And he doesn't know what we do in private. Oh, yes, he does. When you hold out on God, believe me, God knows you're holding out. And when you're sold out to God, he knows you're sold out. When you've sold the property and you've given it all, God knows you've given it all. But when you've sold that property and you've kept back part of it, God also knows that to be true. What a lot of people don't understand today is the Bible teaches us that if we receive any reward in this life for various things that we might do and what have you, then our eternal reward is forfeited. Did you hear that? See, Ananias and Sapphira, they wanted to get the same eternal reward as everybody else who was selling their property and giving all the proceeds to Peter and to the <laughs> apostles. They 
They wanted the same eternal reward. They wanted to be marked down in God's book as one of those who sold what they had and gave it all. But the truth was, they had not sold what they had and given it all. They had only sold what they had and given a part or a portion. And the truth of the matter is, I, I had somebody recently talk to me. Well, Brother Mara, I need I know you need a car so bad, and bless God, I just I just really want to help you have a car so bad because I want to help the work of God, and I want to help the church, and blah, 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 blah. And then this person proceeded to tell me how they could sell me a car. Now, guess what? There's no reward in that. You got paid. You're not going to stand before the Lord and say, Well, Lord, bless God, I helped Brother Mara to have a car, and I deserve some reward in heaven for having, helping Brother Mara to have a car. And the Lord would have said, You'd have gotten a reward if you'd have given it. But instead of being sold out, you're a holdout. You got your reward. You got something for it. It doesn't matter if you got $10 or two, you got something. And according to God's divine economy, whatever you decide to accept as a payment or as a reward for something, that's all you're going to get. End of the story. How do you like that, huh? So if that person had really wanted to be blessed, if they would really wanted to be uh, on God's good side, so to speak, and really have the Lord bless them for their actions and for their deeds, they would have been wiser to have given the car than to have tried to explain how they could sell it to me. You're following me today. When I was pastoring my churches years ago, my first church in particular, I remember I went through a, a, an experience where my dad wound up taking the car that I had away from me. My mother had given it to me. It's a long story, but I've told you, my dad was a real scoundrel, you know, real character. And he tricked me out of my car and just pulled a stunt and I was without a car. Here I was pastoring a church, 18 years old, had no car one day. All of a sudden I had to call my uncle to get a ride home. Had to call Philip to get a ride home from dad's house. Didn't know what I was going to do. How do you pastor a church? Especially back then, my Lord, I already had 30 people or close to it anyway. I said, Lord, how do I pastor church? How do I do what I'm supposed to do when I don't have a vehicle to get around? Well, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take the train if I have to. I'll take the bus if I have to. Whatever i got to do, I'm going to get the job done. And I did for about a week or so, maybe two weeks. And then one of the men in my church came to me and he said, Brother Morrow, I'm buying my wife a new car. So I decided to buy her a new car. Uh, Ford LTD or something to that effect. And he said, the vehicle that we have is a wonderful vehicle. It's a Dodge Dart. And back in those days, boy, those things used to run like a top. You remember those, those flat six engines? And all? Run like a top. He said, it's an excellent car. Everything works. It's a good car. He said, I was going to trade it in, but for the six or eight hundred dollars they're going to give me for trade-in, I'd rather give it to you so you can have a car. Now that was sold out, not hold out. That was somebody who was willing to give what he had. It wasn't about, well, I'll sell it to you for eight hundred dollars, Brother Mora. You see what I'm trying to say? Yes, he didn't come back at me with, well, I'll sell it to you, Brother Mora, for, you know, a discount of five hundred dollars. No, because if he'd have gotten the five hundred, that's all he'd have gotten. Heaven would have been shut up to him. But instead, he said, no, I'll give it to you. I just want to give it to you because the work of God is important to me, and you're important to me, and I want you to have a car. And he just gave me this car. I drove that little car for the longest time. It was nice. It was not fancy. I mean, you know, it would dodge dart. We're not talking about a Lincoln or a, you know, or a, a Cadillac or anything. We're talking about a Dodge. But it drove, brother, and boy, I mean, you know, I went and did all the stuff I had to do. They had a big uh, conference up in Massachusetts, a Sunday school conference. 
that I had to attend for a couple of days, and I stayed at a motel out in Massachusetts for this conference, and the car broke down while I was there. Something happened to the radiator. My grandfather, bless his heart, had to come out and get me and take me back home, and then he had to bring me back four hours each time. Each trip was four hours. And then drive me back to pick my car up after the weekend was over and the mechanic had a chance to fix it, you know. He said, I could have towed you home and we could have fixed it at home instead of leaving it at the shop. And I said, well, Grandpa, I didn't know that and I wasn't much in the mood to be towing behind my grandfather who drove like a banshee anyway. I said, Lord have mercy, I ain't going to be pulled by a rope and behind that guy going 90 miles an hour and then all of a sudden the brakes have to go on and I'll be right up, you know, the rear end of his car. So anyway, I left the car to get it fixed and, and they were able to get it fixed. You know, it didn't cost a whole lot, but back then I had the money. It wasn't a problem. We paid for it. It was no big deal. Kept driving the car. After a while, suddenly the engine decided to die. It just decided to go. It was an old car. What you going to expect, right? My grandfather said, we can replace the engine in that. He said, here's some money. Handed me, I forget at the time, this was back in 83, 84, 84, 85, somewhere around there. And he said, here's some money. Go, go buy a used engine down there at Seymour Auto Parts. You can get one for about 350 So he gave me the money to go buy the engine. My grandfather supported my ministry. He supported everything I did every step of the way. And I went to Seymour Auto Parts with my Uncle Philip, and we bought an engine. And Philip had a little pickup truck, and we put the engine in the back of the pickup truck. Grandpa said, now I'm too sick because he had just about retired about then. And he said, I can't really get up under a, a vehicle and do what I need to do these days to work on it. He said, but I'll tell you what we need to do, and then you help me do it. He said, I'll try and do what I can. That man went out there every day for about a week and worked with me to replace the engine in that car. We, he had a hoist, you know, up on a tree. You know, I'm talking a shade tree mechanic, you know. He had a hoist in a tree, and we hoisted the old engine out, you know, and, and got the new engine ready and, and do all that. And my grandfather, bless his heart, there he was with me day after day helping me. And I'm about as mechanically inclined as Thumbelina, you know. I don't know nothing about all this stuff. And we get the old engine out, we get the new engine in, and Grandpa used to get real sick in his stomach. He, he had a lot of stomach trouble for a lot of years. And he used to get real sick in his stomach when he would try to work. Uh, at anything for very long. He, he'd work for a few hours, all of a sudden he'd start vomiting. You know, his stomach would just get upset. You know, he, it, when he retired, he had that problem, you know. And he'd be trying to, he'd be in there, you know, cranking screws with me and doing all these things. Now, you need to un undo this one and then, and you'll see, and he could tell me exactly what I was going to see underneath that car. You're going to see uh, this, and you need to unscrew this, this, and this, and blah, blah, blah. And he'd tell me exactly what we were doing. I had no clue. I'm just, okay, whatever you say. I hope I'm not sending anybody into space because Lord knows I don't know what I'm doing. So I proceeded to work with my grandpa. Well, he got to where he was real ill and he couldn't really stay out there with me for a couple of days. And during that time, my car's down again. I thought, oh God, here we go again. I'm without a car. But this, of course, it had been six months or better, you know, eight months since my car had been down. All at once, I'm at my grandmother's house. I'm not even at the church office. I'm at my grandmother's house. Somebody calls and asks for me. I get on the phone, and he says to me, Reverend, I hear you need a car. I said, well, who's this? He said, well, my name is so-and-so. I'm out here in Newington, Connecticut. I said, where? That's a long way from where I'm from. Long way from where I'm. We're talking almost two hours, about an hour and a half. I said, good God, who are you? He said, I heard you need a car. I still don't know where he heard it from. He said, but I heard you need a car. He said, I've got a little Chevy Vega, uh, um, 
sorry, no, no, that's what mom had given me that uh, dad took away with the Chevy Vega. He had a little Ford Pinto station wagon. That was the Ford version of what mom had given me. It was identical car, basically, except Ford versus Chevrolet version, you know? Yeah. He said, I've got a little copper tone Ford Pinto station wagon. He said, it runs like a top and it's yours if you want it. And I felt like I had to tell him. I said, sir, I have to tell you I'm in the process of replacing the engine in my other car right now. And in a week or so, it'll probably be ready. He said, that's all right. I've got this car. It's yours if you want it. Who am I to look a gift horse in the mouth? I said, okay. I said, I'd be happy to have it. I said, boy, that would come in handy, especially when we're having to bring food to people and do stuff, you know, where you're carrying little things to folks. And we did a lot of that. And we will again one day. And uh, I said, yeah, that'll be real handy. So now I'm expecting him to tell me where I can come to get it. But instead he says, how do I get to you? you got to be kidding me. How do you get to me from Newington? I don't even know where Newington is. <laughs> I'm not even sure where you're at. He said, well, I'm over here on the other side of Hartford or whatever it was. It was oh, it was a long way away. So I begin to tell him, you know, I give him directions. And, well, you, you guess you're going to have to take 95 down. And if you want, get on Route 8 North and follow Route 8 North to the Beacon Falls exit. Beacon Falls is a little hole-in-the-wall town, so they ain't got but one exit. If you miss it, you'll be in another town. So I'm warning you now, look for it. When you see it, that's the one you want. And I gave him directions, and two hours later, knock, 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 there he was at the door with keys in hand, handed me the keys to this car. I said, here, if you'll just sign this for me, and that we've got a bill of sale, it's yours, set up, there you go. Got into his Cadillac with his wife who had followed him all that way down to where I was at and drove off. No pomp, no circumstance, nothing. Just handed me the keys. Said, That's it. You know what? There's great reward for that man in heaven. Yes, amen. I don't know if that man realizes what he did. I don't know if he realizes how much God was ready to bless him. I'll tell you what, I got a feeling he does know. Because that's probably why he did it. He's not stupid. <laughs> But he just handed me the keys to the car. And before too long, I had my other car fixed. Now I had two cars. But you know what? God can only do that when he's operating with a bunch of sold-out folks and not hold-out folks. You know what I'm talking about? That first car was given to me by a member of my church who was a sold-out folk. He was a sold-out man. He wasn't trying to play games with God. He wasn't trying to hold back on God. He wasn't trying to do one thing and act like he was doing something else. He was just trying to do what needed to be done to help the ministry go forward. And then the second man was the same thing. He was a sold-out man who came along and said, You know what? You need a car. I've got a car. End of the story. Where do you want me to bring it? I'll tell you what, the church would be in a whole lot better position today here in Dallas if we had some sold-out folk in the neighborhood. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you all right now, I'm going to say it real plain, okay? God knows when you're holding out. God knows when you're playing the game, but you're not living the life. God knows when you're putting on the face, but you're not doing the deed. God knows when you're trying to look like you're something that you're not. He knows when you're holding out on Him. And you're not actually sold out to what you're doing. You're not sold out to the cause. And you know, I say that, I remind myself of that. As a preacher, I look at some of these preachers sometimes that I know, and believe me, I know quite a few that are, they just use God's people for everything they can get out of them. But you know what's funny, Joaquin? They're the most successful ones without fail. You want to build a church with thousands of people? Just start soaking them dry. Just start taking all their money. Just start using them for everything they're worth. Because the world is in a state where we are so gullible and so foolish that if a church is not doing things the way that the big guys are who are doing everybody 
dirty. We don't think the one who's doing it right is the little guy who's not doing it the way they're doing it. Y'all didn't follow that. Let me try to rephrase that for you. We see T.D. Jakes over there charging $10 for a cassette tape of Sunday morning's message, and we see him and think, well, look how big and how successful and how great his church is. Look at how big his ministry is. Look at how many people he's got. Well, of course he's got a great big church and a great big ministry. Did you hear what I just said? He charges $10 for a cassette. But my Bible said that Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. And that's the policy I have followed in every church that I've ever pastored. I don't sell you the gospel. I give it to you. If you want it, it's yours. But they'll look at me and say, I'm the crazy one. They'll look at me and say, he's the one who's doing it wrong. You're supposed to market the gospel. No, you're not supposed to market the gospel. You're supposed to give the gospel away. That is right. But you know what, Cody, if I wanted to be a lot more successful, I'm not even kidding. I'm, a ser I'm so serious. I wish you all could understand how serious I am. If I wanted to be a whole lot more successful, all I'd have to do is emulate T.D. Jakes. All I'd have to do is emulate some of these raw parsleys on television. All I'd have to do is start doing things the way they do it because the majority of people are convinced that that's the way it's supposed to be done. But what they don't know is that this preacher is going to be sold out and not a hold out. I'm either going to do it God's way or no way. I'm either going to give it away or I'm not. it's not going out at all. You hear what I'm saying? It's either not going to be about money or it's, it's that I'm going to just have to quit because I'm not going to do this thing that the way the devil wants people doing this thing. I'm not going to be motivated in ministry the way that other preachers are motivated in ministry. I'm not in this thing to make a profit. I'm in the thing to win souls. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah. And I made up my mind years ago, God, I'll be, a, I'll be sold out and not a hold out. All right, all right. Want you to know some folks want to try and pull the wool over God's eyes. But God can neither be tricked, he can't be caught, he cannot be fooled. We only fool ourselves when we believe that the Lord is blind and what uh, is really going on in our lives, he does not see. Oh, you're only kidding yourself, honey. You're only tricking yourself. In Genesis chapter 27, verses 6 through 23, we read the story of Jacob deceiving his father Isaac with his mother's help, with Rebekah's help. And in verses 15 through 16, then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids on the goats, on his hands, and on the smooth part of his neck. This is where we derive the saying, you pull the wool over somebody's eyes. Right. It's when... Rebecca helped Jacob to put pieces of wool on his body so that his father Isaac would think that it was, uh, instead of being Jacob, it was his elder son Esau. And they were able to pull the wool over his eyes, so to speak, because uh, uh, Isaac was of dim sight. He wasn't able to see well. His eyes were going blind. I want you to know, children, you cannot fool God. You cannot trick God. You cannot con God. We've had somebody in our church for a while who wanted to sit back and act like a whole bunch of things, like everything was perfect, and this individual was perfect, and this individual was great and wonderful, and everybody else had a problem. But I got news for you. The Holy Ghost and I knew better. The Holy Ghost and I knew different. The Holy Ghost and I knew what was really going on, because you can't pull the wool over God's eyes. And when will people learn that you can't? And I only wish that person were in this service right now to hear what I'm preaching. Because when this message was given to me, I thought he would be. 
You can't fool God. You think you're going to sit there and act like you're so righteous and so perfect and so holy, and yet so much of what you do contradicts the way that a child of God ought to behave. So much of what you say is stuff that a, a child of God shouldn't be saying. That's right. That's right. And you think God is deaf, dumb, and blind, that he can't hear, he can't see what you're saying, he can't hear the words that you're speaking, he can't see what you're doing? Oh, yes, he can. He can. That's right. It's one thing to say that there are a lot of good people being labeled as evil. If you remember a message I preached a couple weeks back, all because of who they are. But it's another thing to recognize that there is a lot of foolishness that goes on in the lives of those who call themselves believers. You hear me now? I don't believe all gay people are, 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 are evil just because they're gay. That's what I'm saying, okay? I don't believe everybody, just because you're gay, you're evil. But I'm going to tell you what. Whether you're gay, whether you're straight, whether you're black, whether you're white, you still got to live right. You still got to be holy before the Lord. You still got to try to do this thing the right way. You still got things you won't do, places you won't go, things you can't say. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. And it's about time we got down to brass tacks and begin to realize there's a right way to do this thing and a wrong way to do this thing. You're either going to be sold out or you're going to be a holdout. But honey, if you're a holdout, there will be no reward for you in eternity. That's right. That's right. That's so just right. pack your bags and don't pack long sleeves. <laughs> A lot of folks are trying to justify and explain away their conduct as though God is somehow simple-minded and unaware of what they're doing. I hear people, I'm sitting sometimes, I hear people call themselves believers and they talk and they say things and they talk about doing things in a way that's illegal. They're breaking the law. They talk about doing things in a way that's deceitful. And I'm thinking to myself, dear God, what's wrong with this person? Don't they realize what they're saying? Are they that deceived? Have they fooled themselves that much that they don't even realize anymore that there's a difference between right and wrong? hear people sit and explain how they did something a certain way. And and I, and I, I, I heard, I won't mention names to embarrass anybody, but somebody was telling me the other day about somebody doing business, talk about cars, somebody doing business, you know, selling cars to people, and then one of the persons he was selling cars to decided he didn't want to have this car over here because he had two of them he was selling so he wanted to switch over to the other car so our good sanctified believer our good christian man turned around and said oh that's fine you can start payments on this car over here of course what he didn't bother to mention is you're starting from scratch because i'm not transferring the payments from that car that's foul that's not the way God's kind of, that's not the way God's people act. That's not the way we do business as a child of that God. That is right. That is right. You know I'm telling the truth, don't you? That you know what I'm right. saying? We don't run around yeah. messing people over like the world messes people over. Honey, when the church acts like the world, there's a problem. That's right. That's right. Because I'll tell you what, you'll never see the world trying to act like the church. Okay. I love it. So when the church starts acting like the world, we got a problem. When you start doing business the way the ungodly do business, when you start trying to mess people over the way that the sinner and the unbeliever try to mess people over, something's wrong in your soul, and you need to pray through. That's right. That is right. I'm going to say this. You like it, lump it. I don't care. I'm going to say it anyway. Living with people because we need a place to live and not because we love and have a commitment to that person is wrong. God's people don't do that. I'll sooner live on the street than I'm going to live with somebody and make them think for two seconds that I even care about them one iota when I don't, just so I can have a place to live. A lot of that goes on in our community. Hello now. That's right. It's wrong. 
If you'll believe God, if you're a child of God, if you'll believe God, God will open the door for you to have a place to live. Believe me, you don't have to sell your body to have a place to live. That's prostitution, no matter how you slice it, no matter how you dice it, no matter how you spell it, no matter how you tell it, it's prostitution. Being involved intimately with someone whom you know good and well is not someone you are even considering as a life partner is wrong. Is it okay that the preacher said that? I know it is, because I said it. Amen. Amen. You're laying down with somebody you know good and well. You're not interested in them as a potential life partner. They're just convenient. They're there for the physical, for the comfort, for the for the uh, having somebody in the house, you know, for the uh, connection, for whatever you want to call it. i got news for you. It's wrong. You do not engage in intimacy with anybody that you are not seriously caring for and very seriously considering as a life partner. Am I telling the truth? Woo, I'll tell you what. Boy, the preacher laying it on heavy tonight, isn't he? Now listen to this. Spending our finances foolishly and then becoming angry with God when he does not rescue us from our calamity that we have placed ourselves in. You know people do that? That's right, they sure do. Let me tell you a little secret. God expects us to be good stewards of all that he places in our care, not just our tithe. He just expects the tithe to go where it's supposed to go. But the rest of the 90%, he expects you to handle it smart. He expects you to handle it with wisdom. He expects you to handle it properly. The first tenth belongs to him as a tithe. And that is meant to support the local ministry and workers in the gospel. But the remaining 90% also belongs to the Lord. The Bible teaches us that everything we have is God. It's not just that 10%. Sometimes we take 10% and give it to the church, and then we go off and spend the other 90% like God don't have any interest in it. Like God don't care how we spend it. Yes, he does. You've got to be smart with what you're doing because if you're faithful with little, the Bible said, what? God will make you ruler over much. Sometimes people say, well, the Lord hasn't blessed me financially. I don't know why God doesn't give me more. I'll tell you why. Because the 90% you've got after your tithe, you're squandering and you're spending ridiculously. And God says, hey, I can't, I can't give this person more? If I give them more, all they do is the same crazy stuff they're doing now, but in a bigger way. <laughs> They'd probably buy a blimp and fly to Europe, you know. I can't give, you know what I'm saying? I can't give them, I can't give them more because they haven't even shown me they can handle what they got. That's right. That is right. We err when we believe that our finances and our resources are ours to do with as we please. No, they're the Lord's. He doesn't, he just doesn't expect us to present them to the ministry as a tithe. When we use our finances foolishly, we show the Lord that we are incapable of handling money wisely. That's right. My Lord have mercy. I'm talking about how believers are supposed to conduct themselves today. You're going to be sold out. You're going to do things the right way or the wrong way. If you're going to be sold out, then you're going to do things the right way. And he, then we wonder why the Lord never opens any new doors for us financially. James addressed this problem in James chapter 4. When he writes in verses 1 through 8, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Now again, I want to point out to you, because I hate... When you use the King James, you know, some of these words come across and they immediately have a certain connotation to them, like lust. And you immediately you're thinking about physical lust, you're thinking about, uh, you know, sexual lust. That's not what James is talking about. He said, ye lust and have not, meaning ye desire and have not. That's right. You've got all these desires for all these different things, and yet you don't have them. He said, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Some of us know what it feels like. Lord, I'm fighting every day of my life to get where I want to go and to have what I want to have, and I'm never getting there. Yes. 
This is what James is talking about. Listen, he said, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, not against people, not against, but just against the system. You struggle your way through life trying to fight against the system to get where you want to be, to have what you want to have. And Paul uh, and James said, yet ye have not, because why ye ask not? Oh, but listen, he goes on now, that's not where it ends. He said, ye ask and receive not. So now, now you're asking, some of you asking, but you're not, like I said this morning in this morning's message, but what are you asking for? Are you like Solomon? Have you got enough sense in your head to say, God, make me the biggest soul winner that ever struck the city of Dallas. And God said, if you'll ask for the right things over here, I'll give you all the rest of it over there. Right. But if you're so focused on what's over there, you'll never get it, and you'll be miserable your entire life struggling to have all that. I've got a brother in his middle 30s, older than me. Mm. I lied. He's younger. I guess considering the tonight's message, I can't lie. He's younger than me. And you know what? He's constantly trying to live up to my father's life. He's constantly trying to have what my father had. Well, by the time Dad was my age, he owned his third house. By the time Dad was my age, he had this, and Dad always had this, and Dad always had that. But you see, you can fight in war and have not. You can fight the system. You can buck the system. You can struggle your whole way through life trying to get something based on the desires of the flesh. That's what the word lust means. The desires of the flesh, meaning not, not that not this isn't about sex. This is about the desires of your humanity. That's right. Letting your humanity rule you and tell you what you need to have, what you've got to have, what you want to have. And James said, he said, the reason you're asking and not receiving anything is because you're asking amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. He said, the whole reason you're asking for it is because it appeals to the flesh. It appeals to what you want in this body. It appeals to what you want in the natural. It's all about this world and not about the other world. It's all about this life and not about life eternal. We're not letting eternity take uh, the pre preeminence and be the thing that is most important in our life so that God can give us not only an eternal but also a temporal. We're too focused on the temporary yep. in this life. And when you focus on that, God said, you ain't going to get there. But Solomon, bless his heart, Solomon, when God gave him a blank check, said, whatever you want, what does Solomon say? Give me wisdom and understanding. I want to be equipped to do the job you've called me to do, Lord. That's the way we ought to be praying. That's the way we ought to be living. God, just give me what I need to do the job you've called me to do. And if there's any other trinkets, if there's any other pleasures, if there's any other blessings you want to send my way, all well and good. But give me what I need to do what you called me to do. Amen. That's the most important thing. And God said to Solomon, because you asked for this and not for all this other stuff, I'm going to give you not only this, but also the other stuff. Amen. And Solomon became the greatest king that ever lived. Had a splendor had a glory about him that was so far renowned that people came from thousands of miles to stand in his presence and observe all the splendor of Solomon's kingdom. You see what God could do for us if we'd only get focused on the right things instead of focusing on all the wrong things? I'll tell you, the devil will help you focus on the wrong things. He'll help you if he can get you distracted looking at all the, well, you need this and you need that and you need, a, you know, a 10-bedroom house and you need this and you need a, a, a Lincoln or a Rolls and you need, you need, you. the devil will distract you with all that mess if he can because he knows if he does it, then instead of your being blessed, you're going to be cursed. Instead of your being sold out, you're going to be a holdout. He goes on to say, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You may remember this from this morning. Do you think that the scripture therefore 
saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse ye hands, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. James is saying, if you've got too much of the world working in your brain so that everything you look at and everything you want in life is based on what the world has planted in there instead of what God wants for your life, he said, then cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. Amen. Almost done. I'm on my last verse. James chapter 1, 26 and 27. The apostle James said, if any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. Hmm. I've heard more Christian people say, talk about stuff that, mother, they didn't need to talk about. Stuff that just should not even be coming out of the mouth of a child of God. I told Joe, I don't want to hear nothing about who you've slept with. I don't want to hear nothing about... Your intimate private life, that's your business. It's between you and God. I do not need to know. I can't stand people who come into an affirming church and think that because we're an affirming church that the rules of play in the gay community are what we operate under. Uh-uh. The rules of play under the Word of God, that's what we operate under. That's right. So I don't want to hear about all these nasty stories about somebody you went out with and telling how, you know, wonderful they were or how good they were or how bad they were or how small or how big or how ugly or how pretty. I don't want to hear it! That's right. It doesn't belong in the house of God. That belongs in the bar room. If you want to talk that trash, go to the bar. Go to JR's. Go somewhere else. But don't be here. Because I made up my mind, we're going to have a sold-out church and not a holdout church. Amen. Not going to have a church full of holdouts. We're going to have a church full of sold-out people that are going to do this thing the whole way, all the way, every bit of the way, or none of the way at all. Am I telling the truth? That's right. Yeah. That is right. But listen to what James goes on to say. Pure religion and undefiled. He said a person who can't keep their mouth under bridle is somebody who whose religion is vain, that it's useless, it's worthless to them. He said, but pure religion and undefiled before God, even the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their afflictions and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Cody, you know what God's religion is all about? It's about, number one, helping people that are less fortunate. That's right. That is right. And number two, it's about keeping yourself in a different place and in a different mindset and in a different way of thinking and in a different way of looking at things than the world does. That's right. That's, That's why right. James said, it's not only to visit the fatherless and the widows and their affliction. He said, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. <laughs> that doesn't mean you can't go out in the world and rub shoulders with sinners and all that. you got to do that. You're living on the planet. But what he's saying is, but you don't have to let the world's mindset get into your head. You don't have to let the world's way of thinking get into your spirit. You don't have to let the world's goals and the world's desires become part of you. That is right. Amen. I've said it before, I love my brother, and I'm not trying to pick on him, the one who, you know, he's constantly trying to keep up with daddy. But I've said it before, I'll say it again. As long as I'm doing the work of God, he said to me one day something about being miserable because he hadn't got nothing to the, and he tried to drag me into it and say, well, you know, you're in the same boat. I said, excuse me, you better back up, son. I'm doing what God called me to do. I love what I'm doing. Every morning I get up, I'm happy. I like what I'm doing. Yeah. Amen. Amen. If you're miserable because you're ever constantly pursuing a goal you can't seem to attain, then don't rub that off on me. I'm quite happy, thank you. I'm doing what God called me to do. And in due season, God is going to lift me up. In due season, God is going to bless me. In due season, God will give me all the accoutrements and the extras. But that's all right if I don't have them right now. I'm still going to do what God wants me to do because that's my first priority. 
I'm going to keep myself unspotted from the world. I'm not going to let my father's successes and my father's uh, accomplishments in his life, I'm not going to let those stain my spirit so that I find myself constantly trying to keep up with him and trying to do what he did. I'm too busy trying to keep up with my heavenly father's successes and my heavenly father's accomplishments, which he did when he walked on the face of planet Earth as the man Jesus Christ. That's the one whose shadow I'm living in. That's the one I'm trying to live up to. God's people don't see things the way the world sees things. We don't do things the way that the world does things. We do things different. And when we're not doing things different, when we're not seeing things different, we're holding out on God. There may be areas in our life where we're holding back on God because we're still trying to see this area over here through the world's eyes instead of through God's eyes. How can, how can I go from a two-bedroom, two two-and-a-half-bath apartment to a one-bedroom, one-bath apartment? I didn't like it. The space is different. I don't have the space. We don't have a church building right now. I don't have an office, so everything's packed in my house. You know, I'm crowded and everything. But you know what? In the long run, what does it really matter? How much does it really matter? When I'm dead, you know what? Ain't an undertaker in the city going to care whether I lived in a one-bedroom, two-bath, or a ten-bedroom, four-bath, or what? What's it going to matter when I stand before God in the judgment? As long as I'm able to do what God's called me to do, that's when I'm happy. And that's why I moved into the apartment that I moved into, because I wanted to stay in the same neighborhood so that if we had to have Bible studies in my home, we could continue to do it in Oak Lawn, which is the heart of our community. Amen. Sure, there are other neighborhoods I'd like to live in. Sure, there's other places I'd like to be. But you know what? That's not what rules my life. The work of God rules my life. What, where God wants me to be so I can be doing what God wants me to do. That's what rules my life. Amen. And that ought to be the way we live our lives. Am I telling the truth? You are. Amen. Ananias and Sapphira were holdouts. They wanted to try to fit in and look like they were just like everybody else, doing things just like everybody else was doing them, when in reality they weren't. Children, we don't need any holdouts. Excuse me, holdouts. We need soldouts. We need people that aren't trying to act like they're doing what everybody else is doing. They're not trying to. Uh, they're not trying to act like they're living the life like the others in the church are trying to live the life. No, we need folks that are actually trying to do the job, trying to get it done, trying to live the life. You want to be a soldout today? You want to be a holdout? I bet you're too embarrassed to say, "Well, I won't be a holdout." <laughs> I don't think anybody in this room wants to be a holdout, am I right? right? Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? Amen. Sold out, not hold out. Amen. Thank God for his word today. And Ananias and Sapphira, they got a harsh punishment. That's just the type for those of us. You know, a lot of folks think, well, God didn't strike me dead for the things I did. But honey, you know what? You've still got to stand before the judgment bar. You're just, right now, you're just dealing, you're talking about life on earth. He cut them short in their life on earth. But God can cut you short in eternity. You don't want that to happen. Nope. I want to be sold out, amen, to serve the Lord with all my vim and vinegar that I've got, amen. I don't want to hold out on him, don't want to hold back, want to give him everything I've got, amen. Master, we thank you, God, for this message. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask Jesus today that you would just... Continue, God, with us as we leave this place and help us, God, to contemplate the word of the Lord. Help us, Master, today to think about the words which have been spoken here. Help us, Lord, to be sold out and not merely holdouts. We don't want to be like Ananias and Sapphira. God, we want to genuinely be sold out willing to do whatever we need to do for the work of God and the kingdom of God to be forwarded in this life. Master, Bless our fellowship, our time together, as we spend time, God, with the rest of the saints in this place. And tonight, God, we just ask that you would continue to help our church to grow, Master, that you'd help us to reach out to people as we do our outreach. 
Help us, Lord, to be soul winners. Help us, God, to reach out to those that are unloved and undesirable, that others have cast aside as though they have no worth. Help us, Master, today to reach out to them in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.